Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, Gayatri Vemuri, from the Delhi School of Economics, extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, guests, esteemed faculty, and bright students to this distinguished lecture being organized under the Delhi School of Economics Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series in collaboration with the Institute for New Economic Thinking, New York. We are honored to have with us Nobel Laureate Professor Michael Spence of Stanford University as our distinguished speaker and Dr. V. Anant Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor of Government of India as the distinguished chair. We are also delighted to have with us We're also delighted to have with us Professor T.C.A. Anand, former Chief Statistician of India and Secretary of Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Professor Rohinton Medora, Chairman of the Board of INET New York, Professor Rob Johnson, President of INET New York, and Ms. Sunanda Nayar Bitkar, Director of Strategic Planning, South Asia Division of INET New York. We also have with us on dais Professor Ram Singh, Director of Delhi School of Economics, and Professor Surendra Kumar, Head of the Economics Department of Delhi School of Economics. We commence today's event with the University Kulkeet, for which I invite Nayanika on stage. I request everyone to please stand for the Kulkeet. Jayati Jaya Jaya Jayati Jaya 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 Everybody, please take your seats. Uh, today is the auspicious occasion of Vasant Panchami and uh, Saraswati Puja. So, we would like to seek her blessings uh, with the Saraswati Mandira. Jaya Jaya Devi Jaya 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 Saraswati Mahi Jaya Jaya Devi Jaya 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 Saraswati Mahi Jaya Jaya Devi Jaya 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 Sara Swati Hasta Kamala Movina Bajai 
Professor Ram Singh of Delhi School of Economics to deliver the welcome address and to introduce the distinguished speaker and chair. Very good morning to all and I welcome you to DSC Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture by Professor Michael Spence. I also welcome chair of uh, this session. Dr. Anand Nageswar, Chief Economic Advisor to Government of India. I welcome all the speakers today in this session and next session, which is a panel discussion. I welcome Professor Mandal among the audience, Sri Ashok Bhattacharyaji of Business Standard, Professor S. A. Roy of Geography Department, my esteemed colleagues, from Delhi School of Economics, from University of Delhi, uh, dear students, and uh, very esteemed uh, guests uh, who have come to attend this talk. It is part of a Diamond Jubilee celebration of Delhi School of Economics, which was established in 1949 by Professor V.K. Arvira. In its journey of more than seven decades, Delhi School of Economics, with its constituent departments, has excelled in their respective areas. It is a, it is a preeminent uh, center of learning in economics, uh, sociology, geography, and related uh, fields. So we attract best of students from, from uh, within the country, and in many cases from overseas. Our students have gone to serve the society and economy with great dedication and distinction. We have tried all along to uphold very rigorous academic standards, at the same time making a learning here, DSC experience uh, as a full of uh, social consciousness. We have made an attempt to bring economics, economic theory, mathematical models to the world of policy, to the real world. In that spirit, uh, uh, we could not have been uh, more honored than having a Nobel laureate like Professor Michael Spence to deliver the distinguished lecture. Professor Spence is a Nobel laureate. He, is, he has been educated uh, at Harvard, at Oxford. His PhD thesis uh, uh, was a landmark that resulted in within a span of one and a half years, two years, to one paper in uh, Journal of Quarter, Quarterly Journal of Economics as Education as a Signaling, and also a book, landmark book on market signalings. This, this work, his PhD thesis work, changed the way 
we can deal with the problem of market failures uh, arising on account of asymmetric information. His ideas have been developed further uh, as and have shaped uh, the economic analysis uh, of adverse selection in mechanism design contract theory. His work also uh, has implications not only not only uh, making students here feel good that once they have a degree from Delhi School of Economics, uh, in, in addition to its intrinsic value, it is a great signal about their ability, about their competence. So that comes from his, his work. His work, the signaling works also have been, have been used in uh, insurance uh, markets and actually a vast range of markets including uh, dividend paid out by, by firms, whether when firms will pay low dividend and high dividend, in spite of uh, dividend payments being subjected to multiple taxation. What I'm trying to tell you here is that he has changed uh, the thinking. And students here uh, have, all of you students, teachers here from economics, have read his, his work uh, in your sec sec second semester. And you will read more of uh, his, his work in subsequent semesters. So, so it's a quite an honor uh, to have you, Professor Spence. We are also lucky to have this session chaired by our chief economic advisor, Professor Anand Nageswar. Professor Nageswar, uh, Dr. Nageswar, and he's a visiting professor at Crea University, and he is a professor uh, uh, in that capacity. He, indeed, he wears many multiple hats. So he's, a, he's an alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad, a University of Massachusetts. His work was on uh, exchange, uh, exchange rate behaviors. He has written several books uh, uh, on derivatives, uh, on growth. He has served private sector and academics with equal distinction. And now he is, uh, uh, you know, ear, eye, and mind of the government. So it's a great pleasure and honor to have you, uh, Dr. Nageswar. So with this, uh, I invite uh, Professor Spence to deliver his talk. We will take about two minutes max that you will lay out, there'll be change in the layout, but uh, uh, I will, I give to you Professor Michael Spence. I'll get started. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, it's a huge honor to be here with you. I, I have three thoughts to share with you, four actually. One, I couldn't get into this school uh, if I were applying now, and so it's a bit um, humbling <laughs> to try to uh, say something interesting to you. Uh, second, this reminds me a little bit of a famous place in Milan where I live in northern Italy. It's called La Scala. It's a fairly famous opera house. It's a little bigger than this, but it has the same kind of feel. The third observation is that shortly after I did my doctoral work and published the papers that Professor Singh referred to, um, I had a visit at the University of Chicago. Now, the University of Chicago then was a little different than it is now. It was pretty kind of market fundamentalist, most things are accomplished by setting prices right. But Gary Becker was there, and Gary Becker is the father of human capital theory. And so I got there and was immediately attacked. And I thought, this is a bit odd. Um, and the reason I was attacked is they thought signaling theory was meant to be an attack on human capital. And so after we'd been interacting for a while, and I figured out where they were going, I said to them, no, 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 hold up here. Uh, I'm not saying you don't accumulate any human capital in school and in university. I'm saying in addition, there's a signaling effect. So we got that straightened out. <clears throat> and I was welcomed back at Chicago. The last observation is I'm going to spend some time on growth patterns in the, in the, in the global economy uh, and then end up with some Fairly, that's my point. Uh, I, you know, I really like these things because they usually have a laser. And if I get a question I don't like, I can zap the person. Uh, when I stopped being an academic administrator, I was the dean of the business school at Stanford, uh, the digital revolution 
was underway, and it's, it's now progressed enormously. Of course, we have the mobile internet, which is less than 20 years old, so it's a little hard to believe that. Uh, but the digital revolution is transforming the in informational structure of markets, as you can probably guess, because of the ubiquity, uh, digitization, and low cost of accessing this information. So I don't think the notion that there are informational gaps of asymmetries and private information has disappeared from the landscape. On the contrary, they're still there. But it is a, it is a very, very different world. Um, so if I were writing that thesis, then I might have said some things a little bit differently. Um, so what I want to do today, uh, and I'll try to do it fairly briskly, is to talk to you about sort of growth patterns in the global economy. And what I want to try to convince you of uh, is that there are really important sort of major tectonic sh uh, structural shifts going on. And much of it will not surprise you. So let me just get on with it. So the way I see the, the global economy, um, and I've spent the last sort of 25 years of my life kind of involved in one way or another with thinking about, you know, helping people understand growth patterns, policies that support them, and so on. So that's the background of this. So one thing, so item one, is we appear to be in an era in which the whole system is being subjected to an increasing batch of, of shocks, uh, crises, pandemics, climate shocks, and so on, that are causing major changes in the way people behave. So for example, uh, you see a distinct pattern of diversification in global supply networks, multinational firms who are the architects of these networks, for many years basically built them on the basis of uh, efficiency and comparative advantage. They're not doing that anymore. Um, this creates all kinds of change, but also opportunity uh, in various parts of the global economy in various regions. The second uh, is, I think, less talked about, but these are major structural changes in the way the global economy is put together. And then the third is a set of scientific and technological transformations that are underway. The one that's most talked about, the one that you probably know the most about, most of you, would be the digital, multi-decade digital one. But there's a revolution in biomedical and life sciences going on. And there's a huge uh, energy transition that we've entered into. <laughs> Um, to try to deal with the problem, the challenge of climate change and sustainability. And so what I've been spending my time at in the recent past is trying to figure out how these big powerful forces interact with each other and how to navigate in a, what feels like a pretty complex and at times confusing world. I wrote a book with Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of Britain, and a friend of mine named Mohamed Alarian, who's an expert on global macro and financial conditions, and I'm not going to talk about the book, but some of what I say today is a reflection of the interactions that we had in the course of putting that together. <laughs> so we just went through a pandemic. We're coming out of the pandemic. Um, there's good and bad features of that exit trajectory. Uh, the bad feature is the global economy is coming out of it with slowing growth. Um, and some of what I'm about to say is, I think, a partial explanation of that. Uh, the good is that, you know, this country, among others, is growing at a very high rate. Um, and I'll talk a bit about India in a minute, um, after I've sort of painted a picture of the global economy. So after the supply, um, supply uh, conditions in the global economy, the disruptions that were caused by the pandemic essentially faded away. Uh, and I won't go into, you know, which ones were but you all know what they are. We had semiconductor shortages everywhere. We had astronomical increases in ocean shipping costs and all that sort of thing. Um, they're gone. Uh, but there's underlying structural, secular, long-term uh, constraining factors in the global economy. So the short version, you forget everything that I say in the next couple of minutes. Just think that the global economy, for the most part, with some notable exceptions, has shifted from a kind of demand constraint to a supply constraint uh, pattern of growth. And the components of that I've listed on this slide, I'm, and I would rather not spend too much time on it, um, but, but let me say a few words about it. So in the last 25 years of working with emerging economies, it, it was easy to see 
that one of the most important events over time in the global economy was the massive infusion of incremental productive capacity that was previously unutilized, right? This is the growth of India, the growth of China, the growth of the ASEAN countries, etc. There were predecessors. Japan grew, South, the South Korean economy grew, the Taiwanese economy grew in a slightly earlier era, but the, but the huge infusion occurred. And that had tremendously important consequences. You had convergence of the emerging economies toward the developed ones. Uh, you had a deflationary pattern of growth. Basically, there was no sign of inflation. You have a generation and a half of people working in business and financial markets all over the world who've never lived in an inflationary environment at all, like the one we have now in much of the world, and especially in the developed world. That big infusion of productive resources that produce the deflationary impact can't go on forever, and its power is fading. Now, it may come back, you know, because there's still lots of underutilized labor and productive capacity in the global economy, but that's an open question. We could have a discussion about it and make educated guesses. But, that, but at the moment, that big, powerful deflationary force is fading. Um, and that was a, that was a, a, an, it was a trend that made the supply elasticity of the global economy, at least on the tradable side, goods and services, enormously large. Right? So if you had a demand surge, for the most part, the supply side didn't have trouble keeping up with it. That's not true now. The reason we have inflation is we had a demand surge coming out of the pandemic, and the supply side did not keep up with it. So what are these supply kinds of constraints? One of them is aging. This will sound strange to you in a very young and dynamic country. But if you take the economies in which the populations are aging rapidly and ask what fraction of the global GDP do they produce, the answer is about 78%. Okay? So about 78% of the global economy is sort of experiencing increasing pressure as these populations get older, retire, the dependency ratios rise, etc. Fiscal stress is being caused in a number of places. A second one is the shocks that I referred to, and, and what's going on there is that for perfectly rational reasons, businesses um, are diversifying. So instead of going to one place where the efficiency was greatest, they now say, well, we have to have three or four. Now, this is a big opportunity in a number of places in the world. So it used to be that a lot of people had trouble competing with China. The United States in the last quarter imported more from Mexico than we did from China for the first time in years and years and years. Okay. This is just a little anecdote, but it's happening all over the place and it's very powerful. It's also being turbocharged by policy and that policy is being driven by geopolitical tensions uh, and lack of trust, and so on. So you, you and there are lots of consequences of this. Um, people are diversifying away from China. In Europe, we're diversifying away from uh, dependence on Russian fossil fuels at a very high at a very high speed and in a very expensive growth slowing process. Um, so this diversification is important for India. I believe it's an opportunity, although. There's a lot of capital rushing out of China <laughs> because people have decided it's at least partially uninvestable from a Western external investor point of view. And a lot of that money's coming in here. Uh, and so, you know, you, it's, that's great. But you might find your exchange rate rising a little bit faster than is ideal uh, from the point of view of long run growth. Dimensions. You can see the, the other dimensions of this. I'll show you a few pictures. The pandemic produced a very big increment in sovereign debt globally. Sovereign debt globally is now over 100% of uh, global GDP. And that has, that is, we have never seen that before. What that, and that is occurring in a rising interest rate environment. Unless these real interest rates subside, and I admit that's an open question, this is an environment in which fiscal space is declining because the debt levels are high and the interest rates are rising. 
and it's an environment in which we're supposed to invest somewhere between four and six trillion dollars a year incrementally to deal with the climate change uh, challenge. You can see these things don't exactly fit together very well at the moment. Um, and so on. I think that's enough on that. But, uh, but there is one other important trend, and you probably won't have seen it here in India, but we will have seen it in statistics for sure. And that is there's a very powerful declining productivity trend. So productivity is not, in the short run, going to help us out of the supply constraint pattern that, that we're in. So what's going on is obvious to all of you. When you have a demand supply imbalance that triggers inflation, the central bank steps in, raises the interest rates, bring this, the aggregate demand side of the economy down until the balance is restored. And they try to do it fast enough before inflationary expectations get embedded, to use the central bank term. And once they become embedded, then inflation develops a life of its own. It's sort of disconnected from whether there's a supply and demand imbalance. And then they, and when that happens, and that did happen, in the Volcker era in America, um, then you have to hammer the economy on the head much harder to get those expectations driven out. So that's kind of a brief summary. Consequences of all this? Well, we have inflation for the first time, that's obvious. Um, we have had a period that many people think got, came to think of as normal, more than a decade after the great financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, in which we had zero nominal interest rates, negative real interest rates, and massive infusions of liquidity into the system by central bank asset purchases with no sign of inflation. None. Okay. Inflation below targets in the major developed economies. Japan, all of Europe, the Eurozone, and the United States, and Canada. We're not going to go back there. I haven't found anybody who when asked the question, do you think after the inflation fight's over, we can go back to zero or negative real interest rates, you know, and massive infusions of, uh, the capital markets definitely want this, right? Because when you do that, and bonds become an uninteresting sort of investment, it drives up the price of equity, and that's why the financial markets are still, you know, hyper-focused on central bank policy. It's the single most important first-order driver of uh, beta-related returns in the markets. Um, but the rest of it, I think, on this slide, can, if you can read it, is pretty obvious. Higher costs of capital, if the interest rates can't go back where they were, you know, less fiscal space, etc. So, <clears throat> quick tour of what those things, so the fading of the emerging economy growth effect is what I call the Lewis turning point. For those of you who are studying in development economics, you will know exactly what this is. It comes from Sir W. Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate in the early stages of the Nobel Prize in economics. And he basically said the early stages of high-speed growth, sustained high-speed growth, are basically achieved by deploying underutilized resources in the economy. And the Lewis turning point is the point where you've used up enough of those underutilized resources that that, that is not no longer the powerful growth engine. And this is talked about routinely in, in important developing economies. You can't spend much time in China without having a debate about whether, in what years did the Lewis turning point come. It's clearly come. The question is when did it come. So that's one powerful force. This is... I won't dwell on this, but that surge of uh, quality, high quality, low cost uh, product, mostly manufactured goods, produced uh, this down here. These are essentially manufactured goods that were imported into the United States. And these are the components of the consumer price index. And you can see the nominal prices, the nominal prices, not real, nominal prices of virtually everything went down over a two decade period up to the to the time of the great financial crisis well if you take away that deflationary force and then you're living with this you've got much higher levels of inflation up here is domestic non-traded services like health care you know government uh, higher education I'm embarrassed to say is up at the top of that graph 
I know this is a, an American phenomenon, but it's, I don't think it's sustainable. This is the productivity picture. It bounces all over the place, but basically it's a downtrend. This is the sovereign debt thing that I referred to. So after the great financial crisis, sovereign debt did not decline. It got, but it did not grow very fast. And then the pandemic produced a huge surge in sovereign debt. Why? Because governments correctly decided that long-term growth was going to be damaged if they permitted significant damage in the balance sheets of the household sector or the corporate sector. In the case of the corporate sector, the private sector would be just loss of businesses. Now, I know some of that happened, but a whole lot more would have happened if governments hadn't stepped in. So a kind of financial way to think about what happened in the pandemic is the governments didn't want permanent impairment of the growth potential, so they stepped in and took the balance sheet damage and transferred it to the sovereign, where it's easier to deal with. Now, it has consequences, probably the right thing to do, but the legacy of the pandemic is much higher uh, sovereign debt levels. Then that varies around the world. Uh, the country I live in started at 135% sovereign debt to GDP ratio and ended at 150. The, the, I think the worrying, this is a manageable problem except in one part of the world, and that is the low income countries. The pandemic and climate change are just a disaster in that world. So the pandemic used up the little fiscal capacity they had, just trying to buffer the economy from the shock. And now we have debt distress and the need for debt restructuring all over the place in that part of the world. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about really low income countries, not middle one income countries, which I don't particularly worry about because they have the resources to deal with this. And now, you know, as a sort of student of growth in the developing world, I used to think that, you know, there were big challenges, governance, you got to get the demographics right, you can't have fertility rates of seven, you know, seven per um, childbearing age woman and <clears throat> kind of pull it off. Uh, but but you could get the job done, basically. Now, and this really has to do with convergence, if you add climate shocks, which are very severe in a wide range of lower income countries, the pandemic shock, very weak fiscal positions and so on, and it's starting to look like, forgive the American slang, a perfect storm. And I think they're probably going to need help or the convergence process will fail at that end of, of the spectrum. So, I, and I believe that's reasonably well understood. It figured prominently in the G20 discussions that, uh, that India uh, organized in this last round. We haven't, uh, this is uh, the aging point, so I won't repeat it. It's, I'll leave these behind. We have huge changes in labor market behavior. So, and it has two parts. One, the older people finally decided to retire. This is the baby boomers, the ones who were born after World War II. So they didn't retire very much after the great financial crisis because their savings had been damaged so badly. Now they're retired and in droves. And the second thing is the young people, having got the pandemic experience, say, are saying, I like hybrid work. And oh, by the way, I don't want to go to work every day. I don't want to work in an inflexible environment. I don't like stress. I don't like safety issues. And I don't like low pay. And who can blame them? <laughs> So they're staying away. And we have labor shortages in all the major labor, uh, in the major employment sectors in the United States. Government, healthcare, construction, traditional retail, hospitality. These employ millions and millions of people in most economies, and uh, people are staying away. And this doesn't help with the supply response, but we're in a, a kind of mini component of the regime change I, I talked about. You can look at these slides and we'll, you know, go through them. This is the, the retirement uh, patterns. You can see there's a burst of retirement now coming out of the pandemic for the first time. Let me take a, I'm, the, what I'm going to do in a minute is convince you that that pretty depressing picture <laughs> in terms of future growth is going to be overridden by some pretty powerful technologies and tools. But before they, I do that, let me make a couple of comments about 
countries and regions that are running counter to the overall trends. And you live in one. Uh, so let me do that first. This is not meant to be a complete summary. So India is the, is the country with the, high, the major economy with the highest potential growth in the world. Um, that used to be China. China now has a per capita income of something like twelve or thirteen thousand dollars. You know, it, 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 no country at those income levels can sustain growth at seven to eight percent. India can, um, and 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 I suspect will. Um, so it's a an outlier. It's starting to get everybody's attention, and your growth, I, I mean, is not far off from that. Meaning, I would say, pretty near potential. So firing on all cylinders. You have a booming digital economy. Uh, there's lots of indices of that. You know this. I mean, it's a huge set of opportunities. You had um, the biometric uh, identification system. The universal payments interface is an innovation in terms of public infrastructure in the financial sector that's so important. I believe it will be replicated in a very, very wide range of countries. It's just better than than any other. And then you had the geo revolution and the dramatic expansion in the mobile internet that uh, the vast majority of Indians now have. And that spawned something that wasn't expected, which is a very large entrepreneurial ecosystem in multiple you know, aspects of digital space, mobile payments, mobile credit, e-commerce, education, healthcare, it goes on and on and on. You have startups, you have, I thought you had 91 unicorns, meaning private companies with a valuation over a billion dollars in a relatively short period of time. I was reliably informed yesterday the correct number is 121. Uh, so it changes every day, and that's a good thing. That's an enormous element of strength in, in two dimensions. One, obviously, opportunity for creative young people you know, to stay and solve important problems and challenges as the economy builds up its, uh, its you know, potential. Um, but it also, many of these business models are profitable and sometimes extraordinarily profitable precisely because they solve some kind of inclusion problem. That is, until you get to a country that where almost everybody lives nearby you know, the whole full panoply of services, the digital technologies are a way of jump-starting access, if you like. In the developing in literature, these are called low-access populations. But you can just think of people in the rural areas. So th this is storytelling, but then I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, you won't, it, won't, it won't surprise you. I'm going to talk about the digital, the breakthroughs in AI and whatnot. The two kids at Stanford, decided that, the, that one of those breakthroughs was image recognition, right? We just couldn't, they couldn't distinguish a cat from a chair before, and now they can. And the reason is because we were trying to tell them what a cat looked like in code, and that doesn't work. Uh, and now we just let the kind of brute force pattern recognition algorithms and neural networks figure it out. Anyway, they thought well, they'd use this to see if we could detect skin cancer. And they got together with the uh, dermatologists. This, for those of you who want to go in this direction, there's some hard work to do. You need the training data set. This training data set was 120,000 images of various kinds of skin cancer that were needed to train the algorithms, the AI. But it worked pretty well. Did it beat the best humans? No. Uh, and I'll come back to this benchmarking question later. Um, and so when I'm teaching the class and I say, so here's a breakthrough, here's an, a use case, uh, what do you think? And they say, well, it's very interesting, but who cares? <laughs> and they say, who cares? Because they live within two kilometers of a dermatologist. <laughs> and I say, yeah, but 85% of the world's population doesn't live within 85 kilometers of a dermatologist. And they say, oh, <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is an AI doesn't have to beat humans to be enormously useful in preventive primary care because it, it gives you a warning that's good enough to tell you you need to get on the train and go get it checked. And you see this pattern, and that's just one story, but when you start looking, you see this pattern over and over again. Access, access, access to retail, you didn't have. Access to credit, 
that's driven by essentially data-based algorithms where the traditional channels can't do it. This is really, in the developing world, enormously important, probably as, as important as the kind of fancy uses of, uh, of really advanced artificial intelligence. Anyway, this is quite revolutionary. I mean, I think, you know, there are remaining challenges here that you all know about. All developing countries, if they're going to have inclusive growth patterns, essentially have to have employment engines that are powerful enough to pick everybody up eventually, not overnight, but eventually. And I think, you know, there's general agreement that um, those employment engines are still in need of, of development. But the bottom line is it's a very impressive thing. You're now the fifth largest economy in the world, I believe, uh, meaning India. Um, it won't be very long, less than a decade, before you're the third largest economy, basically because you're about to pass the UK and Germany, I think. It's, and that will leave you with, uh, or maybe Japan's in there somewhere. Uh, so, you, you know, one of the things we used to talk about in China, and they didn't want to hear it, is once you get to be this big, you start to have big impacts on the rest of the world, and your sort of policy agenda has to start to be a balance between the very demanding and important internal growth agenda and whatnot. And you can see this starting already. I mean, G, G, uh, you know, India's leadership in the G20, taking it seriously, you know, exporting important intangible assets like the architecture of the global payment system. This is natural at this stage, and it will become a more prominent part as your size and impact gets bigger and bigger. A few words on China. I imagine you have some interest in that. China obviously had a stellar uh, period of growth. I don't think it's over, uh, but they are in a very, uh, in a lull right now. So they were in zero COVID. Most of the rest of us, including India, did not do that. Everybody expected when it ended, and it ended very suddenly, when the population and particularly the students objected um, by holding up pieces of paper. Do you see this? Pieces of paper with nothing on it. Uh, it's, it's a little dangerous to write anything on it in China. So they just put up pieces of paper. The message was, it was signaling, right? And it was transparent. <laughs> the signal was not missed. And they opened up overnight faster than we expected. We thought it would happen around the, the uh, National People's Congress at, just overnight. And everybody expected a bounce and it started, but then it stopped. Uh, so let me, I'll give you my take on what's, what's, what the problem is there. One of them is just huge excess capacity in real estate, debt financed excess capacity in real estate. And that bubble is burst. Uh, so you have failing companies that are going to go bankrupt. Uh, you have the spillover effect of that, because households mainly invest in real estate in many countries, but especially in China. So when the real estate market goes to hell, the household balance sheets are not far, far behind, and that depresses consumption, which is an, even in China, which has low consumption relative to other components of aggregate demand, that doesn't help. And the other there's another issue that's probably less interesting to you. The municipal governments are broke because they don't have enough sources of revenue. They used to sell land and nobody wants to buy land to build real estate anymore. But the other major problem, and this I think is contains lessons for governments and policymakers around the world, is that in pursuit of regulation uh, of what they thought of as sort of out of control, um, you know, private sector development, especially in the digital areas, the mega platforms, they landed on them with such a heavy hand that they, and, and, and it went beyond the digital area, um, that there's a loss of confidence and, and momentum in the private sector. So they're under investing too. Uh, so in the short run, it's going to take them a while to kind of recover from this. I would say we've got three or four years of well below full potential growth in China. After that, uh, although there are many people who are just permanently pessimistic, especially Americans who, because we're kind of in the midst of a new era of geopolitical tensions and, and strategic competition with China, 
But China's intangible assets, the ones that drive long-term growth, the human capital, the science, the technology is just stunningly good. And so if you're um, kind of forecasting, I would say, a negative forecast in the long term is a fairly bad idea uh, for the Chinese economy. Can the United States prevent China's growth? The answer is flat out no. We can slow it down a little bit uh, with, uh, by withholding, you know, fairly important things like the semiconductors you use to train the big, the biggest Gen AI algorithms and so on. They don't really have an alternative to that. Uh, that's a perfect substitute, but it's not a permanent. Uh, it's not a permanent condition. So that's those couple. Now let me switch and. <laughs> I'm not going to try to convince you of anything, except, except I, I'm going to tell you that probably the breadth of the technological and scientific tools that are being delivered to us is maybe even wider than most of you have thought. And what's really interesting is that these technologies and tools are coming at us faster and faster. They're very powerful. Their costs are going down. This is really the important point. Their costs are going down dramatically, and they're accessible pretty much everywhere in the world. So the only thing that matters anymore is where are the people who have the knowledge, education, and creativity to kind of figure out how to use them. But this is not a, a, an environment in which you're short of tools to accomplish extraordinary things. So let me show you at least a few of them that, that I see. This is, by the way, you're, you all know the center of gravity as defined by our colleague Danny Kwa, has been shifting east. Right? So it's a little bit east of you now in the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, solar costs. Ten years ago, I chaired a commission on growth and development with distinguished politicians, retired politicians, policymakers from all over the developing world. Well, if we asked the question, how are we going to engage with uh, climate? agenda, the answer was we can't. We've got all this cheap coal and solar isn't even within shooting distance of being competitive. It is now, in 10 years. Uh, now people, you know, qualify that and say, well, it's capital intensive technology, so if your capital costs are higher than they are in the developed world, that'll slow you down a bit. That's true. That's what Ajay Banga and others are going to worry about at the World Bank. Uh, but still, and you need a smart grid and you need to back up power because, you know, some of the green is not reliable and all that. But still, it's still a revolutionary change, an opportunity <laughs> that we didn't have before. And those yellow lines are installed capacity of solar, you know, PV panel uh, electricity generation. Now, is this enough? No. <laughs> we got an enormous long way to go. I mean, global emissions. Uh, just gross emissions from fossil fuels are something on the order of 38 tons. I mean, some people say they're 50, but let's take 38. That's just, you know, three or four times the level that's even remotely close. And we're still going up, you know. So the good news is people are engaged in this. The bad news is we haven't figured out a way to turn it down. The United States has peaked at a very high uh, per capita levels. India's per capita is going to grow. It just has to as part of the growth agenda. China, further down the road, is going to peak before 2030, and most people think that's a credible forecast, and I do too. Uh, and Europe is, you know, ahead of the rest of us, but coming from the advanced country, you know, sort of configuration at the start. So they're just coming down faster. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time. The climate scientists in the IPCC says we basically are going to blow the carbon budget in something like the next eight years or something like that. Uh, so I think the correct conclusion is we're going to have some uh, fairly important climate change before we get around to, you know, practically solving the problem. This is TSMC. It's the leading semiconductor fab in the world since Taiwan. This is their product map. So if, for those of you who are carrying around iPhones, the chip in your iPhone is a 5 nanometer chip. It's pretty fast, does some AI, 
The next generation is going to be three nanometers. They're very close. TSMC and Samsung are probably the only uh, companies in the world that can make these things right now. Um, and that's not a terribly stable situation. <laughs> so TSMC has been strong-armed into producing uh, a facility in Arizona that will produce a five nanometer chip. It'll be expensive, according to them, etc. cetera. Um, if you look at this thing after I've left, this, these little numbers here, what, this is 291 and associated with a three nanometer chip. Does anybody know what that number is? It's, well, it's, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's the number of transistors, think switches, on a three nanometer chip per square millimeter. So then we have a chip sort of this size. I don't know how many square millimeters that is, but there's an awful lot of, these are supercomputers by the standards of the 1980s and 90s. And these folks aren't done. This is the AI revolution. So this may or may not be familiar to you, uh, but we had handwriting recognition, speech recognition, lots of translation capabilities, etc. There's AI in, you know, Siri and things like that. And then this one was really important and happened very fast. And that's image recognition. This is the ability to recognize objects, whether they can name them or not. Right. So there's different versions of this. But an AI can distinguish between a cat and a dog, uh, even if you haven't told them that the names are cat and dog. If you, see what I mean. if you tell them what the names are, then they can get that right, too. Um, and then you have this extraordinary explosive uh, growth, and these over here are the, the, the Gen AI. So it's coming at us faster and faster. We don't know yet. With Gen AI so new, we're in a period of ex exploration and experimentation. Um, and not, I'll tell you why I think it looks so powerful in a minute. But um, it's, we don't know, for example, we know that when you train a, a Gen AI model, like a large language model, there's several billion parameters in it. That's how it's able to do what it does, switch domains, talk to you about whatever you want to talk about. They're going to do it again with another in big increment in the billions. We don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a whiteboard here. But we don't know if that will produce performance increases that look exponential or whether we're on an S-curve somewhere. And, we don't, and if we're on an S-curve, we don't know where the S is. We literally don't have a clue um, because there's no theory model, if you like, in your terms, that tells you, you know, how these things exactly work and where the diminishing returns, if any, ever set in, right? So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff we don't know at this stage. Um, so that's the AI revolution. This is image recognition. This, these are applications of AI. So almost all of you will have heard about DeepMind, uh, even if you don't know the name. Uh, based in London, now owned by Google or Alphabet, because they taught a computer to win the game of Go. And the game of Go has the characteristic that the permutations and combinations are so large that even the biggest, most fastest computer can't catalog them all and kind of, you know, do it by brute force. But they figured that out. Their next project was something that you probably don't, may not have heard of. Uh, it's in the life sciences, and basically they set out to figure out if an AI could predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein from the amino acid sequence that defines what's in the protein. Now, why is that important? Well, if you don't know the three-dimensional structure of a molecule like a protein, you don't know what it's going to bind to. It's just kind of core, centrally important in drug and vaccine and drug development, vaccines, and everything else. Um, <clears throat> so I set out to do it. It took two years, and it kind of worked. I mean, these are prediction machines, remember. They're, they make probability statements when the, with the output. It's a probability statement. But if the probability is pretty high and you can confirm it, then, you know, you've got a big head start. So then they took the 200 million known proteins ran the algorithm and predicted the three-dimensional structure and published it as an open source database 
which you can access at no cost from anywhere in the world. Then I mean, just think of that. Somebody once probably taught, taught you about increasing returns in your in economics course. This is zero marginal cost and fantastically productivity increasing in biomedical research. It's just one simple example of the kind of thing that's going on. See, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is it's this kind of thing, even if you can't demonstrate it you know, in a kind of totally rigorous way that makes me believe the, the assertion I made at the start, which is there's a set of tools that, that are accessible, low cost, you know, available to all the creative talent in the world that uh, are going to transform the human condition in various dimensions. DNA sequencing is a core technology. The first one cost $10 million. It, those costs declined, the, the scale on the vertical axis is logarithmic. Um, it behaved almost exactly like Moore's Law for a while, and then dropped like a stone. The DNA, full DNA sequence time, I'm almost done. Full DNA sequence now costs uh, $250. It's still declining. And there's other examples that I'll leave you with. Um, so the reason I wrote a paper with a guy named James Manika, he's the vice president of Google, and that paper basically, and this is it, says there's lots of downside risk associated with any powerful technology, whether it's gene editing or big powerful Gen AI. But the upside potential is enormous, and so we were just trying to rebalance the scales. And the proposition that we advanced was that under ideal conditions, if the technology with public policy support is diffused widely in the economy and not monopolized either by mega platforms or big entities that can afford to experiment it, like the big banks and so on, the productivity surge is enormous. This is a super general purpose technology. It's very hard to find a place in the economy where you can't use it. And so I, I hope you'll take a look. This is a very useful uh, piece of analysis by published last June by McKinsey Global Institute and it, sent, and it basically says a conservative preliminary estimate of the productivity impact of Gen AI is somewhere in the order of 4.4 trillion dollars and it's probably double that um, once you start you know expanding the scope. And so I'll just finish with this. So is it all pie in the sky? There's a few studies that are starting to emerge. This one was done by Eric Bernalson and some colleagues. Eric's the head of the Digital Economy Lab at uh, Stanford. Uh, at Stanford. And basically what they found, a company and a consulting firm that had developed an AI to support, not replace, support the uh, the customer service agents in the tech sector, you know, supporting customers. So the customers say, I can't connect to the network, this, that, the other thing. And the customer service agent is supposed to solve the problem. And the algorithm was trained on thousands and thousands of hours of audio recordings of customer service, customer interactions, um, combined with performance measures such as, did they solve the problem? How long did it take to solve the problem? Did they make the customer really angry? You know, et cetera. Because the AIs will pick up the, uh, if you like, the non-strictly cognitive side as well. And then they deployed the algorithm by giving it to half the customer service agents and not the other half. And they got, and then two results came, and I've written them down here. The productivity increase, as measured by the differential, was 14% and immediately, not you know after a long learning curve. And they had given the, the AI to a range of service, customer service agents from very, relatively new and inexperienced to quite relatively experienced. So they paid attention to where it had the biggest impact. And this will not surprise you. The biggest impact was at the inexperienced end. There, the impact was 35%. Why? Because intuitively, you will immediately get this, because the AI essentially summarizes all of the experience 
in a kind of carefully curated, filtered way, and delivers it back as a substitute for going down this multi-month learning curve. Anyway, so I've run out of time. Uh, and uh, I'll just say one final thing. AI is bringing terror to people in the labor markets. So I want to assure you of two things. <laughs> one is it's not coming for your job. We're going to use it as a tool in economics. It's just one of the one part of the enormous footprint that this will have. And the second thing is there really is a very, very powerful automation bias. And Eric Bernalson has kind of described where it comes from. Alan Turing, a genius who gave us computers, basically said we'll we'll assess progress in AI by asking, can we produce a machine that when a human being interacts with that machine, the human being thinks they're interacting with another human? The next step, and that's a perfectly you know, reasonable stretch goal for AI. We're pretty close in, in the large language models, for example. Second, all AIs are benchmarked against human, because it seems natural, right? How are we doing on image recognition, you know, how are we doing on taking the law school aptitude test? They're all benchmarked the same way. And some of them come in way above, and some come in about the same level or a little bit above. Some come in below in the way I described to you before. It's the next step that's dangerous. Whether it's a company and its executives implementing it or just the way the public thinks about it, and that is, well, when the AI passes the human, why don't we get rid of the human? That's the AI bias. The natural use of these things is not to replace humans. They're fallible, they hallucinate, they make stuff up, right? They're pro prediction machines that are just probabilities. They do write first drafts well. If you're a computer coder, it won't be long before the first draft of the computer code will be written by this, this uh, technology. But you're not going to hand in the computer code that the AI wrote you're going to check it. They write their first reports for doctors. They'll put a lot of people who do media copy out of business. The reason these AIs are so powerful is two things. It's the first AI ever that has a human-like capacity to change domains. That is, it knows what you're talking about. You can talk to it about the Italian Renaissance, and switch to computer coding, and to some subject like inflation in economics. You don't have to tell it what you're talking about, or what the domain is, it just knows. Uh, that's completely unique. And the other thing that makes them powerful is you don't need technical training to use it. Chat GPT had 100 million users in two months. That's just never happened before. So that's why I'm optimistic, and I hope uh, some of it's of interest to you. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. V. Anant Thank you, Professor Michael Spence, for really two the force of various issues that we are all thinking about, but for which we really don't have answers for. Uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are obviously running short of time, and those who want to ask questions should remember that there is only one DSC Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture today, and it has already been delivered. So therefore, your questions have to be really questions, short and sweet. I'm going to take about three questions in one go and then have Professor Michael Spence respond to them. And then I will do a quick summary and wrap up before we head out for tea. So here, the floor is now yours for questions. There's a lady out here who raised her hand first in the, fourth, in the fifth row. Hi, sir. Um, so my question is that with decreasing productivity, what does it imply for global growth? 
uh, as in is there's going to be a convergence across the economies or uh, the current trend as in some countries are converging like for example us uh, is uh, yeah. that's one question uh, uh, no no we can't have more than one our uh, next one please <laughs> There's a lady here as well, right here in the third row. Good morning, sir. My question is: What differences exist in strategies of developed and developing countries to supply chain and economic growth? Good. There's a third question again, another from a lady. So, gentlemen, are very quiet. Uh, there's a lady here. <laughs> Am I audible? Okay. As Professor Spence just said that um, he forecasted China's growth will be back to normal what it was. But my question is that China's GDP share was overtaken by India, Vietnam, and Bangladesh-like countries. Do you think that we can replace China's productivity in that case, and China will not be able to achieve its full maximum what it was before? Okay. So we'll uh, have Professor Michael Spence respond to these three questions first, and then we will see whether we have time for one or two more questions. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So I'll be brief. I, I, let me say also that because I used up more time than I should, I will. I don't need to drink tea. Um, so I got to stick around and talk with people <laughs> uh, if you're interested. Um, so I think the question of productivity and convergence is an open question. So the goal is to have this technology accessible and deployable both across economies, big and small businesses, multiple sectors, and so on, which, by the way, is not the historical pattern. Previous rounds of digital adoption and places where it's been studied show big patterns of divergence. So this is not a done deal, and you certainly can't count on the private sector to do it by itself. There's policy that's needed. I would say the same thing is desirable across boundaries so that it eventually gets to a full range of countries. You know, I, I think, you know, my colleague here, who's uh, the chief economic advisor to the Indian government, will recognize that the way we deploy it in one country will not be the way we deploy it in another, because the challenges are different. The tools are there, you know, so it may be that, you know, if you don't have a labor shortage, you probably, in, in certain sectors, you don't want to focus on productivity, you probably want to focus on things like access or some of the examples I gave. Um, I didn't completely understand the developing and developing country in the second question. So could I have some help here? Sir, my question is what differences exist in strategies of developing and developed countries to address supply challenges and economic growth? Okay. So Developing countries always uh, basically succeeded by finding a way to connect to the global economy. If you take a, a developing country, regardless of its size, its starting size, everybody's small at the start, doesn't matter how many people you have, um, and you isolate it from the global economy's technology, uh, know-how, and markets, you can't grow. Uh, it can grow, but you can't grow at 7 8% and pull it off for 25 years, which is what we've seen in the post-war period. None of that's changed. What's changing is the challenge and complexity of accessing the global economy in a world in which there are increasing numbers of barriers being stuck up, including by the United States. So we have sanctions. We're trying to keep technology from getting to China. That involves all kinds of other countries that don't really like you know, the emerging economies are pretty much uniformly declaring that they don't want to be aligned with one or the other and have adopted a much more pragmatic, you know, we'll cooperate with you if we have an interest in it, subject by subject, area by area. So that's a more complicated world. I don't think it's, un well, there are times when it's um, difficult. So, for example, it's not uncommon to find multinational confronting regulatory regimes that are not only different, they're just flat out contradictory. You can see in the world of the digital world, there's a very powerful uh, trend to make sure the data is, resides domestically. 
that's fine. But if you're running global supply chains on digital platforms, the notion that you, the data can't move across the thing is a little inconsistent with that natural tendency in the direction of security and self-defense. So it's a more complicated world. I think I'll just conclude that part by saying the, the, the ones that worry me are the low-income countries uh, at the moment. I, I don't have any doubt. Uh, last one is um, China. So China's just, you know, has per capita income $13,000 plus or minus. You know, it's about 10 years ahead of India if you do it in kind of growth metrics. Uh, they, they're going to have different growth patterns than they had in the past. They'll look, be different than your growth patterns for a while. Um, all I really was trying to say about China is that its potential growth is probably 5 or 6 percent for a decade. They're well below that now, even though the official numbers don't say, because, you know, basically they had a bad year, so the denominator is too low. I mean, to put it in arithmetic terms. And uh, what I'm trying to say is after three or four years of I'd say three, of kind of getting the imbalances taken care of, they'll go back to that potential growth because they have the intangible assets to do it. When you see a, a very large number of countries stall in what's come to be called, unfortunately, the middle income trap, the, re the normal reason they stall is their development strategy doesn't evolve as, as the incomes rise, right? The, the growth dynamics in a high middle income country are just totally different than the growth dynamics in a low income country. You know, the Lewis effect doesn't work <laughs> in a high income country, etc. So, bottom line, um, I'm not, there's a lot of people who are bullish on China kind of full stop in the long run. I'm not one of them. Um, I got a signal from your director that I should uh, end the Q&A session at this point in the interest of time. So I will abide by his instructions mm -hmm. and uh, confine my closing remarks to about three to five minutes uh, and then we'll have at least 15 <coughs> minutes to 20 for tea before we reassemble for the panel discussion. Uh, it was very good to hear from Professor Michael Spence that well before the government of India released a white paper, Chinese students used white paper to bring about policy change with respect to COVID, right? <laughs> By flashing blank sheets of paper at the government to bring about a policy change. So white paper does seem to be effective, uh, so uh, in one sense. But jokes apart, I think it was a very impressive overview of where we stand today. And I think uh, Professor Michael Spence presented a fairly optimistic picture of the impact of uh, technology on human productivity, given that we are going to be a supply constrained world marked by aging uh, and also declining productivity in other aspects. But purely in the interest of uh, stirring uh, questions in your head and debate as it should be in an academic setting, I'll just highlight a few uh, strands of uh, divergent thoughts that arose in my head as I was listening to him. Uh, he's right that we are moving from a demand-constrained world to a supply-constrained world, which means we are moving from an era of disinflation or deflation over the last three to four decades to one of maybe higher inflation. How high? We don't know yet. Uh, yesterday's consumer price index data from the United States, both core and headline inflation rates probably were a reminder that we are not done yet with our fight against inflation. Uh, but that said, when it comes to supply constraints, it's appropriate that the government in India, because we have been always a supply constrained economy for a very long time. That is why our growth spurts have been more of sprints than marathons in the past, compared to what China was able to achieve since 1979. So in that sense, the uh, the emphasis on creating physical and digital infrastructure, on capital investments, public spending, and also getting the financial sector back on track will all hopefully uh, give us better supply endowment than we had before. And if our inflation performance in 2022 and 2023 was any indication, perhaps, I mean, I'm not saying we have, perhaps we have, uh, 
probably learn to manage the growth inflation or overheating trade-offs a bit better and that could be what happened in 2022 and 2023 when inflation peaked at little less than 8% on a headline basis is probably a sign that some of the supply side reforms of the last six to eight years are, are beginning to or will begin to have their impact in a positive way, lengthening our financial and economic cycles than before. That's a good story. That's a good news that we have. But he also highlighted two things about India, which we have to keep in mind. <coughs> He mentioned that uh, potential for exchange rate appreciation as a, as a possibility, as a reality that we may have to live with. And I think possibly due to capital flows or because of high growth expectations in India and therefore the return differential for investors will probably lend an appreciation bias to the Indian rupee vis-a-vis -vis the dollar in the coming years. And therefore, how are we going to manage that? How are our exporters used to about 2 to 3% annual depreciation over the last 30, 40 years? They have to now think more seriously, and so should policymakers about productivity. And in this regard, he also mentioned that employment engines in India are not powerful enough. And he's probably uh, right, especially post COVID, the engine is warming up a little slowly, but data which we got from the CLEMS database of RBI, which is now available up to 2122, uh, does give us some signs for hope for encouragement because uh, the reverse migration which we witnessed in 2019-20 and 2020-21, uh, those two years, uh, in 21-22, they did reverse, i.e. agricultural employment declined, manufacturing employment rose uh, in 21-22. And I believe that uh, in, uh, to, in the next two years for which the data will come in the coming months will show that the re-reversal of the, agri the, the rural-oriented migration which we saw during COVID years is probably coming back because agricultural employment was declining since 2004 until 2019 for 15 years. It was as it should be for an economy moving from primary to secondary and tertiary sectors. Now, I'll just conclude with one point. Uh, uh, in, a, in a supply constrained economy, I think the public debt endowment of developed countries is going to be not only adding to the supply constraint, but Inflation at one, at one level can be considered as a solution to the high public debt, which he said was a logical response to the balance sheet constraints that households and businesses faced during COVID. I agree with that. It was a logical response, but we can debate the quantum, the duration, because the U.S. fiscal deficit is still at 7.5% of GDP. But inflation is in, at one level a technical solution, a technical default for the high levels of public debt. But it also has implications for social stability uh, and, and economic well-being of the households because everything from rents to climate insurance to energy bills are set to rise. And if inflation is a partial answer to the high public debt levels carried by the developed world government sector, what does it do for the household sector? And what does it do for the cost of small and medium-sized businesses? That's a question mark, especially in an environment where we have political and cultural polarization in the developed world. If social and economic stability are also threatened by high cost of living in a supply-constrained world, we could potentially have a fairly uh, 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 combustible mix there. And I would also like to conclude with one point Dr. Uh, Professor Michael Spence made about the positive impact of AI on, on productivity, uh, etc. I think uh, I just began reading uh, a 2018 book by conservative politician Jesse Norman uh, uh, on Adam Smith. It promises to be a good book. And I would just quote a few lines. There is an increasing body of work to suggest that humans are being psychologically and socially rewired by their interactions with machines, websites, feeds, apps, games, social media environment, and that these missions have a fundamentally different agenda to our own. They seek 
not to provide information, but to control attention. Of course, for AI, you may say it's something different. But it is quite possible for humans to become costlier for humans to construct a worldview of their own than to lily pad between briefly valuable items of conventional wisdom. In other words, people can become both shallower and more individualistic. And I think I will not go on reading from this book. I would like you to pick it up if you want to proceed further. But when we talk of supply constraints, we only talk of you know resources, finances, and uh, supply of goods and services and trade, etc. But one of the biggest supply constraints is going to be human attention span and human mental endowments and capability to deal with the very complex problems we have brought upon ourselves. One philosopher said, progress is human's innate ability to complicate simplicity, which we have done over the last 60, 70 years post World War II. So do we have that supply endowment in good quantity? to be able to deal with the very challenges which we have brought upon ourselves. With that question, I will, on your behalf, thank Professor Michael Spence for an extremely thought-provoking lecture, as would befit the occasion of DSC Diamond Jubilee. And as, as he said, he doesn't want to have tea, so you can have tea and ask your questions outside, and then we will reassemble here, not later than 11.45 for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Spence and Dr. Nageshwaran. I invite all of you to join us for tea and refreshments in the front lawns of the building. Uh, and we'll see you again in 15 minutes for the panel discussion. I also request the students to please wait for the guests and the faculty to exit before exiting. Thank you.